Chapter Twelve of La Bar by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Keen Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Easy to find an excuse for this visit, though it will seem strange to Chanteloup, whom I have neglected for months," said Durtal on his way toward the Rue Bagneux. Supposing he is home this evening, and he probably isn't, because surely Hyacinthe will have seen to that. I can tell him that I have learned of his illness through Des Hermies, and that I have come to see how he is getting along. He paused on the stoop of the building in which Chanteloube lived. At each side and over the door were these antique lamps with reflectors, surmounted by a sort of cask of sheet iron painted green. There was an old iron balustrade, very wide, and the steps, with wooden sides, were paved with red tile. About this house there was a sepulchral and also clerical odour yet there was also something homelike though a little too imposing about it such as is not to be found in the cardboard houses they build nowadays you could see at a glance that it did not harbour the apartment house promiscuities decent respectable couples with kept women for neighbours the house pleased him and he considered hyacinthe the more desirable for her substantial environment he rang at a first-floor apartment a maid led him through a long hall into a sitting-room he noticed at a glance that nothing had changed since his last visit it was the same vast high ceilinged room with windows reaching to heaven there was the huge fireplace on the mantelpiece the same reproduction reduced in bronze of Remier's jeanne d'arc between the two globe lamps of japanese porcelain he recognized the grand piano the table loaded with albums the divan the chairs in the style of louis the fifteenth with tapestried covers in front of every window there were imitation chinese vases mounted on tripods of imitation ebony and containing sickly palms on the walls were religious pictures without expression and a portrait of chanteloube in his youth three-quarter length his hand resting on a pile of his works an ancient russian icon in nihilode silver and one of these christs in carved wood executed in the seventeenth century by bogard de nancy in an antique frame of gilded wood backed with velvet were the only things that slightly relieved the banality of the decoration the rest of the furniture looked like that of a bourgeois household fixed up for lent or for a charity dance or for a visit from the priest a great fire blazed on the hearth the room was lighted by a very high lamp with a wide shade of pink lace stinks of the sacristy durtal was saying to himself at the moment the door opened madame chanteloube entered the lines of her figure advantageously displayed by a wrapper of white swanskin which gave off a fragrance of frangipani she pressed durtal's hand and sat down facing him and he perceived under the wrap her indigo silk stockings in little patent leather boutines with straps across the insteps they talked about the weather she complained of the way the winter hung on and declared that although the furnace seemed to be working all right she was always shivering was always frozen to death she told him to feel her hands which indeed were cold then she seemed worried about his health you look pale she said you might at least say that i am pale he replied she did not answer immediately then yesterday i saw how much you desire me she said but why why want to go so far he made a gesture indicating vague annoyance how oh, funny you are she went on i was re-reading one of your books to-day and i noticed this phrase the only women you can continue to love are those you lose now admit that you were right when you wrote that it all depends i wasn't in love then she shrugged her shoulders well she said i must tell my husband you are here durtal remained silent wondering what role chanteloube actually played in this triangle chanteloube returned with his wife he was in his dressing-gown and had a pen in his mouth he took it out and put it on the table and after assuring durtal that his health was completely restored he complained of overwhelming labours i have had to quit giving dinners and receptions he said i can't even go visiting i am in harness every day at my desk and when durtal asked him the nature of these labours he confessed to a whole series of unsigned volumes on the lives of the saints to be turned out by the gross by a tour firm for exportation yes said his wife laughing and these are sadly neglected saints whose biographies he is preparing and as durtal looked at him inquiringly chanteloube also laughing said it was their persons that were sadly neglected the subjects are chosen for me and it does seem as if the publisher enjoyed making me eulogize frowsiness 
i have had to describe blessed saints most of whom were deplorably unkempt l'arbre who was so lousy and ill-smelling as to disgust the beasts in the stables saint cunegonde who through humility neglected her body saint opportune who never used water and who washed her bed only with her tears saint sylvia who never removed the grime from her face saint radegonde who never changed her hair shirt and who slept on a cinder pile and how many others around whose heads i must draw a golden halo there are worse than those said durtal read the life of marie la coque you will see that she to mortify herself licked up with her tongue the dejections of one sick person and sucked an abscess from the toe of another i know but i must admit that i am less touched than revolted by these tales i prefer saint lucius the martyr said madame chanteloube his body was so transparent that he could see through his chest the vileness of his heart his kind of vileness at least we can stand but i must admit that this utter disregard of cleanliness makes me suspicious of the monasteries and renders your beloved middle ages odious to me pardon me my dear said her husband you are greatly mistaken the middle ages were not as you believe an epoch of uncleanliness people frequented the baths assiduously at paris for example where these establishments were numerous the stove-keepers went about the city announcing that the water was hot it is not until the renaissance that uncleanliness becomes rife in france when you think that that delicious reine margot kept her body macerated with perfumes but as grimy as the inside of a stove-pipe and that henri quatre plumed himself on having reeking feet and a fine armpit my dear for heaven's sake said madame spare us the details while chanteloube was speaking durtal was watching him he was small and rotund with a bay window which his arms would not have gone around he had rubicund cheeks long hair very much pomaded trailing in the back and drawn up in crescents along his temples he had pink cotton in his ears he was smooth-shaven and looked like a pious but convivial notary but his quick calculating eye belied his jovial and sugary mien one divined in his look the cool unscrupulous man of affairs capable for all his honeyed ways of doing one a bad turn he must be aching to throw me into the street said durtal to himself because he certainly knows all about his wife's goings-on but if chanteloube wished to be rid of his guest he did not show it with his legs crossed and his hands folded one over the other in the attitude of a priest he appeared to be mightily interested in durtal's work inclining a little listening as if in a theatre he said yes i know the material on the subject i read a book some time ago about gilles de Ray, which seemed to me well handled it was by abbe bossard it is the most complete and reliable of the biographies of the marshal but chanteloube went on there is one point which i never have been able to understand i have never been able to explain to myself why the name bluebeard should have been attached to the marshal whose history certainly has no relation to the tale of the good perrault as a matter of fact the real bluebeard was not gilles de ray but probably a breton king comor a fragment of whose castle dating from the sixth century is still standing on the confines of the forest of carnoy the legend is simple the king asked Geroc, count of vannes for the hand of his daughter trifine Geroc refused because he had heard that the king maintained himself in a constant state of widowerhood by cutting his wife's throats finally saint gilda promised Geroc to return his daughter to him safe and sound when he should reclaim her and the union was celebrated some months later trifine learned that comor did indeed kill his consorts as soon as they became pregnant she was big with child so she fled but her husband pursued her and cut her throat the weeping father commanded saint gilda to keep his promise and the saint resuscitated trifine as you see this legend comes much nearer than the history of our bluebeard to the told tale arranged by the ingenious perrault now why and how the name bluebeard passed from king comor to the marshal de ray i cannot tell you know what pranks oral tradition can play but with your gilles de ray you must have to plunge into satanism right up to the hilt said chanteloube after a silence yes and it would really be more interesting if these scenes were not so remote what would have a timely appeal would be a study of the diabolism of the present day no doubt said chanteloube pleasantly for durtal went on looking at him intently unheard of things are going on right now i have heard tell of sacrilegious priests of a certain canon who has revived the sabbats of the middle ages 
chanteloube did not betray himself by so much as a flicker of the eyelids calmly he uncrossed his legs and looking up at the ceiling he said alas certain scabby weathers succeed in stealing into the fold but they are so rare as hardly to be worth thinking about and he deftly changed the subject by speaking of a book he had just read about the fronde durtal somewhat embarrassed said nothing he understood that chanteloube refused to speak of his relations with canon d'ocre my dear said madame chanteloube addressing her husband you have forgotten to turn up your lamp wick it is smoking i can smell it from here even through the closed door she was most evidently conveying him a dismissal chanteloube rose and with a vaguely malicious smile excused himself as being obliged to continue his work he shook hands with durtal begged him not to stay away so long in future and gathering up the skirts of his dressing-gown he left the room she followed him with her eyes then rose in her turn ran to the door assured herself with a glance that it was closed then returned to durtal who was leaning against the mantel without a word she took his head between her hands pressed her lips to his mouth and opened it he grunted furiously she looked at him with indolent and filmy eyes and he saw sparks of silver dart to their surface he held her in his arms she was swooning but vigilantly listening gently she disengaged herself sighing while he embarrassed sat down at a little distance from her clenching and unclenching his hands they spoke of banal things she boasting of her maid who would go through fire for her he responding only by gestures of approbation and surprise then suddenly she passed her hands over her forehead ah oh, she said i suffer cruelly when i think that he is there working no it would cost me too much remorse what i say is foolish but if he were a different man a man who went out more and made conquests it would not be so bad he was irritated by the inconsequentiality of her plaints finally feeling completely safe he came closer to her and said you spoke of remorse but whether we embark or whether we stand on the bank isn't our guilt exactly the same yes i know my confessor talks to me like that only more severely but i think you are both wrong he could not help laughing and he said to himself remorse is perhaps the condiment which keeps passion from being too unappetizing to the blasé then aloud he jestingly speaking of confessors if i were a casuist it seems to me i would try to invent new sins i am not a casuist and yet having looked about a bit i believe i have found a new sin you she said laughing in turn can i commit it he scrutinized her features she had the expression of a greedy child you alone can answer that now i must admit that the sin is not absolutely new for it fits into the known category of lust but it has been neglected since pagan days and was never well defined in any case do not keep me in suspense what is this sin it isn't easy to explain nevertheless i will try lust i believe can be classified into ordinary sin sin against nature bestiality and let us add demoniality and sacrilege well there is in addition to these what i shall call pygmalionism which embraces at the same time cerebral onanism and incest imagine an artist falling in love with his child his creation with an erodiad a judith a helen a jeanne d'arc whom he has either described or painted and evoking her and finally possessing her in dream well this love is worse than normal incest in the latter sin the guilty one commits only a half offence because his daughter is not born solely of his substance but also of the flesh of another thus logically in incest there is a quasi-natural side almost licit because part of another person has entered into the engendering of the corpus delicti while in pygmalionism the father violates the child of his soul of that which alone is purely and really his which alone he can impregnate without the aid of another the offence is then entire and complete now is there not also disdain of nature of the work of god since the subject of the sin is no longer as even in bestiality a palpable and living creature but an unreal being created by a projection of the desecrated talent a being almost celestial since by genius by artistry it often becomes immortal let us go further if you wish suppose that an artist depicts a saint and becomes enamoured of her thus we have complications of crime against nature and of sacrilege 
an enormity which perhaps is exquisite he was taken aback by the word she had used she rose opened the door and called her husband dear she said durtal has discovered a new sin surely not said chanteloup his figure framed in the doorway the book of sins is an edition ne varietur new sins cannot be invented but old ones may be kept from falling into oblivion well, what is this sin of his durtal explained the theory but it is simply a refined expression of succubacy the consort is not one's work become animate but a succubus which by night takes that form admit at any rate that this cerebral hermaphrodism self-fecundation is a distinguished vice at least being the privilege of the artist a vice reserved for the elect inaccessible to the mob if you like exclusive obscenity laughed chanteloube but i must get back to the lives of the saints the atmosphere is fresher and more benign so excuse me durtal i leave it to my wife to continue this marivaux conversation about satanism with you he said it in the simplest most debonair fashion to be imagined but with just the slightest trace of irony which durtal perceived it must be quite late he thought when the door closed after chanteloube he consulted his watch nearly eleven he rose to take leave when shall i see you he murmured very low your apartment tomorrow night at nine he looked at her with beseeching eyes she understood but wished to tease him she kissed him maternally on the forehead then consulted his eyes again the expression of supplication must have remained unchanged for she responded to their imploration by a long kiss which closed them then came down to his lips drinking their dolorous emotion then she rang and told her maid to light durtal through the hall he descended satisfied that she had engaged herself to yield tomorrow night end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of la Bar by jory karl heismans translated by keen wallace this librivox recording is in the public domain he began again as on the other evening to clean house and establish a methodical disorder he slipped a cushion under the false disarray of the armchair then he made roaring fires to have the rooms good and warm when she came but he was without impatience that silent promise which he had obtained that madame chanteloube would not leave him panting this night moderated him now that his uncertainty was at an end he no longer vibrated with the almost painful acuity which hitherto her malignant delays had provoked he soothed himself by poking the fire his mind was still full of her but plethoric content when his thoughts stirred at all it was at the very most to revolve the question how shall i go about it when the time comes so as not to be ridiculous this question which had so harassed him the other night left him troubled but inert he did not try to solve it but decided to leave everything to chance since the best planned strategy was almost always abortive then he revolted against himself accused himself of stagnation and walked up and down to shake himself out of a torpor which might have been attributed to the hot fire well well was it because he had had to wait so long that his desires had left him or at least quit bothering him no they had not why he was yearning now for the moment when he might crush that woman he thought he had the explanation of his lack of enthusiasm in the stage fright inseparable from any beginning it will not be really exquisite to-night until after the newness wears off and the grotesque with it after i know her i shall be able to consort with her again without feeling solicitous about her and conscious of myself i wish we were on that happy basis now the cat sitting on the table cocked up its ears gazed at the door with its black eyes and fled the bell rang and durtal went to let her in her costume pleased him he took off her furs her skirt was of a plum colour so dark that it was almost black the material thick and supple outlining her figure squeezing her arms making an hourglass of her waist accentuating the curve of her hips and the bulge of her corset you are charming he said kissing her wrists and he was pleased to find that his lips had accelerated her pulse she did not speak could hardly breathe she was agitated and very pale he sat down facing her she looked at him with her mysterious half sleepy eyes he felt that he was falling in love all over again 
he forgot his reasonings and his fears and took acute pleasure in penetrating the mystery of these eyes and studying the vague smile of this dolorous mouth he enlaced her fingers in his and for the first time in a low voice he called her hyacinthe she listened her breast heaving her hands in a fever then in a supplicating voice i implore you she said let us have none of that only desire is good oh i am rational i mean what i say i thought it all out on the way here i left him very sad to-night if you knew how i feel i went to church to-day and was afraid and hid myself when i saw my confessor these plaints he had heard before and he said to himself you may sing whatever tune you want to but you shall dance to-night aloud he answered in monosyllables as he continued to take possession of her he rose thinking she would do the same or that if she remained seated he could better reach her lips by bending over her your lips your lips the kiss you gave me last night he murmured as his face came close to hers she put up her lips and stood and they embraced but as his hands went seeking she recoiled think how ridiculous it all is she said in a low voice to undress put on night-clothes and that silly scene getting into bed he avoided declaring but attempted by an embrace which bent her over backward to make her understand that she could spare herself those embarrassments tacitly in his own turn feeling her body stiffen under his fingers he understood that she absolutely would not give herself in the room here in front of the fire oh well she said disengaging herself if you will have it he made way to allow her to go into the other room and seeing that she desired to be alone he drew the portiere sitting before the fire he reflected perhaps he ought to have pulled down the bed covers and not left her the task but without doubt the action would have been too direct too obvious a hint ah and that water heater he took it and keeping away from the bedroom door went to the bathroom placed the heater on the toilet table and then swiftly he set out the rice powder box the perfumes the combs and returning into his study he listened she was making as little noise as possible walking on tiptoe as if in the presence of the dead she blew out the candles doubtless wishing no more light than the rosy glow of the hearth he felt positively annihilated the irritating impression of the lips and eyes of hyacinthe was far from him now she was nothing but a woman like any other undressing in a man's room memories of similar scenes overwhelmed him he remembered girls who like her had crept about on the carpet so as not to be heard and who had stopped short ashamed for a whole second if they bumped against the water pitcher and then what good was this going to do him now that she was yielding he no longer desired her disillusion had come even before possession not waiting as usual till afterward he was distressed to the point of tears the frightened cat glided under the curtain ran from one room to the other and finally came back to his master and jumped onto his knees caressing him durtal said to himself decidedly she was right when she refused it will be grotesque atrocious i was wrong to insist but no it's her fault too she must have wanted to do this or she wouldn't have come what a fool to think she could aggravate passion by delay she is fearfully clumsy a moment ago when i was embracing her and really was aroused it would perhaps have been delicious but now and what do i look like a young bridegroom waiting or a green country boy oh god how stupid well he said straining his ears and hearing no sound from the other room she's in bed i must go in i suppose it took her all this time to unharness herself from her corset she was a fool to wear one he concluded when drawing the curtain he stepped into the other room madame chantelouve was buried under the thick coverlet her mouth half open and her eyes closed but he saw that she was peering at him through the fringe of her blonde eyelashes he sat down on the edge of the bed she huddled up drawing the cover over her chin cold dear no and she opened wide her eyes which flashed sparks he undressed casting a rapid glance at hyacinthe's face it was hidden in the darkness but was sometimes revealed by a flare of the red-hot fire as a stick half consumed and smouldering would suddenly burst into flame swiftly he slipped between the covers he clasped a corpse a body so cold that it froze him but the woman's lips were burning as she silently gnawed his features 
he lay stupefied in the grip of this body wound around his own supple as the and hard he could not move he could not speak for the shower of kisses travelling over his face finally he succeeded in disengaging himself and with his free arm he sought her then suddenly while she devoured his lips he felt a nervous inhibition and naturally without profit he withdrew i detest you she exclaimed why i detest you he wanted to cry out and i you he was exasperated and would have given all he owned to get her to dress and go home the fire was burning low unflickering appeased now he sat up and looked into the darkness he would have liked to get up and find another nightshirt because the one he had on was tearing and getting in his way but hyacinthe was lying on top of it then he reflected that the bed was deranged and the thought affected him because he liked to be snug in winter and knowing himself incapable of respreading the covers he foresaw a cold night once more he was enlaced the gripe of the woman's on his own was renewed rational this time he attended to her and crushed her with mighty caresses in a changed voice lower more guttural she uttered ignoble things and silly cries which gave him pain my dear oh hun oh i can't stand it aroused nevertheless he took this body which creaked as it writhed and he experienced the extraordinary sensation of a spasmodic burning within a swaddle of ice packs he finally jumped over her out of bed and lighted the candles on the dresser the cat sat motionless considering durtal and madame chanteloup alternately durtal saw an inexpressible mockery in those black eyes and irritated chased the beast away he put some more wood on the fire dressed and started to leave the room hyacinthe called him gently in her usual voice he approached the bed she threw her arms around his neck and hung there kissing him hungrily then sinking back and putting her arms under the cover she said the deed is done now will you love me any better he did not have the heart to answer ah yes his disillusion was complete the satiety following justified his lack of appetite preceding she revolted him horrified him was it possible to have so desired a woman only to come to that he had idealized her in his transports he had dreamed in her eyes he knew not what he had wished to exalt himself with her to rise higher than the delirious ravenings of the senses to soar out of the world into joys supernal and unexplored and his dream had been shattered he remained fettered to earth was there no means of escaping out of oneself out of earthly limitations and attaining an upper ether where the soul ravished would glory in its giddy flight ah the lesson was hard and decisive for having one time hoped so much what regrets what a tumble decidedly reality does not pardon him who despises her she avenges herself by shattering the dream and trampling it and casting the fragments into a cesspool don't be vexed dear because it is taking me so long said madame chanteloup behind the curtain he thought crudely i wish you would get to hell out of here and aloud he asked politely if she had need of his services she was so mysterious so enticing he resumed to himself her eyes remote deep as space and reflecting cemeteries and festivals at the same time and she has shown herself up for all she is within an hour I have seen a new hyacinthe talking like a silly little milliner in heat all the nastiness of women unite in her to exasperate me after a thoughtful silence he concluded i must be young indeed to have lost my head the way i did as if echoing his thought madame chanteloup coming out through the portiere laughed nervously and said a woman of my age doing a mad thing like that she looked at him and though he forced a smile she understood you will sleep to-night she said sadly alluding to durtal's former complaints of sleeplessness on her account he begged her to sit down and warm herself but she said she was not cold why in spite of the warmth of the room you were cold as ice oh i am always that way winter and summer my flesh is chilly he thought that in august this frigid body might be agreeable but now he offered her some bonbons which she refused then she said she would take a sip of the alkermes which he poured into a tiny silver goblet she took just a drop and amicably they discussed the taste of this preparation in which she recognized an aroma of clove tempered by flour of cinnamon moistened with distillate of rose-water 
then he became silent my poor dear she said how i should love him if he were more confiding and not always on his guard he asked her to explain herself why i mean that you can't forget yourself and simply let yourself be loved alas you are reasoning all the time i was not she kissed him tenderly you see i love you anyway and he was surprised to see how sad and moved she looked and he observed a sort of frightened gratitude in her eyes she is easily satisfied he said to himself what are you thinking about you she sighed then what time is it half past ten i must go he is waiting for me no don't say anything she passed her hands over her cheeks he seized her gently by the waist and kissed her holding her thus enlaced until they were at the door you will come again soon won't you yes yes he returned to the fireside Oof, it's done he thought in a whirl of confused emotions his vanity was satisfied his self-esteem was no longer bleeding he had attained his ends and possessed this woman moreover her spell over him had lost its force he was regaining his entire liberty of mind but who could tell what trouble this liaison had yet in store for him then in spite of everything he softened after all what could he reproach her with she loved as well as she could she was indeed ardent and plaintive even this dualism of a mistress who was a low cocotte in bed and a fine lady when dressed or no too intelligent to be called a fine lady was a delectable pimento her carnal appetites were excessive and bizarre what then was the matter with him and at last he quite justly accused himself it was his own fault if everything was spoiled he lacked appetite he was not really tormented except by a cerebral erethism he was used up in body filed away in soul inept at love weary of tendernesses even before he received them and disgusted when he had his heart was dead and could not be revived and his mania for thinking thinking pre-visualizing an incident so vividly that actual enactment was an anticlimax but probably would not be if his mind would leave him alone and not be always jeering at his efforts for a man in his state of spiritual impoverishment all save art was but a recreation more or less boring a diversion more or less vain ah oh, poor woman i am afraid she is going to get pretty sick of me if only she would consent to come no more but no she doesn't deserve to be treated in that fashion and seized by pity he swore to himself that the next time she visited him he would caress her and try to persuade her that the disillusion which he had so ill concealed did not exist he tried to spread up the bed get the tousled blankets together and plump the pillows then he lay down he put out his lamp in the darkness his distress increased with death in his heart he said to himself yes i was right in declaring that the only women you can continue to love are those you lose to learn three years later when the woman is inaccessible chaste and married dead perhaps or out of france to learn that she loved you though you had not dared believe it while she was near you ah that's the dream these real and intangible loves these loves made up of melancholy and distant regrets are the only ones that count because there is no flesh in them no earthly leaven to love at a distance and without hope never to possess to dream chastely of pale charms and impossible kisses extinguished on the waxen brow of death ah that is something like it a delicious straying away from the world and never the return as only the unreal is not ignoble and empty existence must be admitted to be abominable yes imagination is the only good thing which heaven vouchsafes to the sceptic and pessimist alarmed by the eternal abjectness of life End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of la barre by jory karl heismans translated by keen wallace this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. From this scene he had learned an alarming lesson, that the flesh domineers the soul and refuses to admit any schism. The flesh decisively does not intend that one shall get along without it and indulge in out-of-the-world pleasures which it can partake only on condition that it keep quiet. For the first time, reviewing these turpitudes, he really understood the meaning of that now obsolete word, chastity and he savoured it in all its pristine freshness 
just as a man who has drunk too deeply the night before thinks the morning after of drinking nothing but mineral water in future so he dreamed to-day of pure affection far from a bed he was still ruminating these thoughts when des hermies entered they spoke of amorous misadventures astonished at once by durtal's languor and the ascetic tone of his remarks des hermies exclaimed ah we had a gay old time last night with the most decisive bad grace durtal shook his head then replied des hermies you are superior and inhuman to love without hope immaculately would be perfect if it did not induct such brainstorms there is no excuse for chastity unless one has a pious end in view or unless the senses are failing and if they are one had best see a doctor who will solve the question more or less unsatisfactorily to tell the truth everything on earth culminates in the act you reprove the heart which is supposed to be the noble part of man has the same form as the penis which is the so-called ignoble part of man there's symbolism in that similarity because every love which is of the heart soon extends to the organ resembling it the human imagination the moment it tries to create artificially animated beings involuntarily reproduces in them the movements of animals propagating look at the machines the action of the piston and the cylinder romeos of steel and juliets of cast iron nor do the loftier expressions of the human intellect get away from the advance and withdrawal copied by the machines one must bow to nature's law if one is neither impotent nor a saint now you are neither the one nor the other i think but if from inconceivable motives you desire to live in temporary continence follow the prescription of an occultist of the sixteenth century the neapolitan piperno he affirms that whoever eats vervain cannot approach a woman for seven days buy a jar and let's try it durtal laughed there is perhaps a middle course never consummate the carnal act with her you love and to keep yourself quiet frequent those you do not love thus in a certain measure you would conjure away possible disgust no one would never get it out of one's head that with the woman of whom one was enamoured one would experience carnal delights absolutely different from those which one feels with the others so your method also would end badly and too the women who would not be indifferent to one have not charity and discretion enough to admire the wisdom of this selfishness for of course that's what it is but what say now to putting on your shoes it's almost six o'clock and mama carre's beef can't wait it had already been taken out of the pot and couched on a platter amid vegetables when they arrived carre sprawling in an armchair was reading his breviary what's going on in the world he asked closing his book nothing politics doesn't interest us and general boulanger's american tricks of publicity weary you as much as they do us i suppose the other newspaper stories are just a little more shocking or dull than usual look out you'll burn your mouth as durtal was preparing to take a spoonful of soup in fact said durtal grimacing this marrowy soup so artistically golden is like liquid fire but speaking of the news what do you mean by saying there is nothing of pressing importance and the trial of that astonishing abbe boud going on before the assizes of aveyron after trying to poison his curate through the sacramental wine and committing such other crimes as abortion rape flagrant misconduct forgery qualified theft and usury he entered by appropriating the money put in the coin boxes for the souls in purgatory and pawning the ciborium chalice and all the holy vessels that case is worth following carre raised his eyes to heaven if he is not sent to jail there will be one more priest for paris said des hermies how's that why all the ecclesiastics who get in bad in the provinces or who have a serious falling out with the bishop are sent here where they will be less in view lost in the crowd as it were they form a part of that corporation known as scratch priests what are they priests loosely attached to a parish you know that in addition to a curate ministrants vicars and regular clergy there are in every church adjunct priests supply priests those are the ones i am talking about they do the heavy work celebrate the morning masses when everybody is asleep and the late masses when everybody is doing it is they who get up at night to take the sacrament to the poor and who sit up with the corpses of the devout rich and catch cold standing under the dripping church porches at funerals and get sunstroke or pneumonia in the cemetery they do all the dirty work 
for a five or ten franc fee they act as substitutes for colleagues who have good livings and are tired of service they are men under a cloud for the most part churches take them on ready to fire them at a moment's notice and keep strict watch over them while waiting for them to be interdicted or to have their celebre taken away i simply mean that the provincial parishes excavate on the city the priests who for one reason or another have ceased to please but what do the curates and other titulary abbés do if they unload their duties onto the backs of others they do the elegant easy work which requires no effort no charity they shrive society women who come to confession in their most stunning gowns they teach proper little prigs the catechism and preach and play the limelight roles in the gala ceremonials which are got up to pander to the tastes of the faithful at paris not counting the scratch priests the clergy is divided thus man of the world priests in easy circumstances these are placed at la madeleine and saint roch where the congregations are wealthy they are wined and dined they pass their lives in drawing-rooms and comfort only elegant souls other priests who are good desk clerks for the most part but who have neither the education nor the fortune necessary to participate in the inconsequentialities of the idle rich they live more in seclusion and visit only among the middle class they console themselves for their unfashionableness by playing cards with each other and uttering crude commonplaces at the table now de hermie said carré you are going too far i claim to know the clerical world myself and there are even in paris honest men who do their duty they are covered with opprobrium and spat on every tom dick and harry accuses them of the foulest vices but after all it must be said that the abbe boudes and the canon d'ocres are exceptions thank god and outside of paris there are veritable saints especially among the country clergy it's a fact that satanic priests are relatively rare and the lecheries of the clergy and the knaveries of the episcopate are evidently exaggerated by an ignoble press but that isn't what i have against them if only they were gamblers and libertines but they're lukewarm mediocre lazy imbeciles that is their sin against the holy ghost the only sin which the all-merciful does not pardon they are of their time said durtal you wouldn't expect to find the soul of the middle ages inculcated by the milk and water seminaries then carre observed our friend forgets that there are impeccable monastic orders the carthusians for instance yes and the trappists and the franciscans but they are cloistered orders which live in shelter from an infamous century take on the other hand the order of saint dominique which exists for the fashionable world that is the order which produces jewelled dudes like mont sabre and didon enough said they are the hussars of religion the jaunty lancers the spick and span and primped up zouaves while the good capuchins are the humble poilus of the soul said durtal if only they loved bells sighed carre shaking his head well pass the coulommier he said to his wife who was taking up the salad bowl and the plates in silence they ate this brie type cheese des hermies filled the glasses tell me durtal asked des hermies do you know whether a woman who receives visits from the incubi necessarily has a cold body in other words is a cold body a presumable symptom of incubacy as of old the inability to shed tears served the inquisition as proof positive to convict witches yes i can answer you formerly women smitten with incubacy had frigid flesh even in the month of august the books of the specialists bear witness but now the majority of the creatures who voluntarily or involuntarily summon or receive the amorous larvae have on the contrary a skin that is burning and dry to the touch this transformation is not yet general but tends to become so i remember very well that dr joannes he of whom gévinger told you was often obliged at the moment when he attempted to deliver the patient to bring the body back to normal temperature with lotions of dilute hydriodate of potassium ah said durtal who was thinking of madame chantelouve you don't know what has become of dr joannes asked carré he is living very much in retirement at lyon he continues i believe to cure venefices and he preaches the blessed coming of the paraclete for heaven's sake who is this doctor asked durtal he is a very intelligent and learned priest he was superior of a community and he directed here in paris the only review which ever was really mystical he was a theologian much consulted a recognized master of divine jurisprudence then he had distressing quarrels with the papal courier at rome and with the cardinal archbishop of paris 
his exorcisms and his battles against the incubi especially in the female convents ruined him ah i remember the last time i saw him as if it were yesterday i met him in the rue grenelle coming out of the archbishop's house the day he quitted the church after a scene which he told me all about again i can see that priest walking with me along the deserted boulevard des invalides he was pale and his defeated but impressive voice trembled he had been summoned and commanded to explain his actions in the case of an epileptic woman whom he claimed to have cured with the aid of a relic the seamless robe of christ preserved at argenteuil the cardinal assisted by two grand vicars listened to him standing when he had likewise furnished the information which they demanded about his cures of witch spells cardinal guibert said you had best go to la trappe and i remember word for word his reply if i have violated the laws of the church i am ready to undergo the penalty of my fault if you think me culpable pass a canonical judgment and i will execute it i swear on my sacerdotal honour but i wish a formal sentence for in law nobody is bound to condemn himself nemo se tradere tenetur says the corpus juris canonici there was a copy of his review on the table the cardinal pointed to a page and asked did you write that yes eminence infamous doctrines and he went from his office into the next room crying out of my sight then joannes advanced as far as the threshold of the other room and falling on his knees he said eminence i had no intention of offending if i have done so i beg forgiveness the cardinal cried more loudly out of my sight before i call for assistance joannes rose and left all my old ties are broken he said as he parted from me he was so sad that i had not the heart to question him further there was a silence carre went up to his tower to ring a peal his wife removed the dessert dishes and the cloth des hermies prepared the coffee durtal pensive rolled his cigarette Carré, when he returned, as if enveloped in a fog of sounds, exclaimed, A while ago, de Hermie, you were speaking of the Franciscans. Do you know that that order, to live up to its professions of poverty, was supposed not to possess even a bell? True, this rule has been relaxed somewhat. It was too severe. Now they have a bell, but only one. Just like most other abbeys, then? No, because all communities have at least three, in honour of the holy and triple hypostasis. Do you mean to say that the number of bells a monastery or church can have is limited by rule? Formerly it was. There was a pious hierarchy of ringing. The bells of a convent could not sound when the bells of a church pealed. They were the vassals, and respectful and submissive as became their rank, they were silent when the suzerain spoke to the multitudes. These principles of procedure, consecrated in 1590 by a canon of the Council of Toulouse, and confirmed by two decrees of the Congress of Rights, are no longer followed. The rulings of San Carlo Borromeo, who decreed that a church should have from five to seven bells, a boys' academy three, and a parochial school two, are abolished. Today churches have more or fewer bells as they are more or less rich. Oh well, why worry? Where are the little glasses? His wife brought them, shook hands with the guests, and retired. Then while Carré was pouring the cognac, de Hermie said in a low voice, I did not want to speak before her, because these matters distress and frighten her, but I received a singular visit this morning from Gévinger, who is running over to Lyon to see Dr. Joannes. He claims to have been bewitched by Canon Docre, who it seems is making a flying visit to Paris. What have been their relations? I don't know. Anyway, Gévinger is in a deplorable state. Just what seems to be the matter with him? asked Durtal. I positively do not know. I made a careful auscultation and examined him thoroughly. He complains of needles pricking him around the heart. I observed nervous trouble and nothing else. What I am most worried about is a state of enfeeblement inexplicable in a man who is neither cancerous nor diabetical. Ah, said Carré, I suppose people are not bewitched now with wax images and needles, with the manei or the dajid, as it was called in the good old days. No, those practices are now out of date and almost everywhere fallen into disuse. Gévinger, who took me completely into his confidence this morning, told me what extraordinary recipes the frightful canon uses. These are, it seems, the unrevealed secrets of modern magic. Ah, that's what interests me, exclaimed Durtal. 
of course i limit myself to repeating what was told me resumed des hermies lighting his cigarette well d'ocre keeps white mice in cages and he takes them along when he travels he feeds them on consecrated hosts and on pastes impregnated with poisons skilfully dosed when these unhappy beasts are saturated he takes them holds them over a chalice and with a very sharp instrument he pricks them here and there the blood flows into the vase and he uses it in a way which i shall explain in a moment to strike his enemies with death formerly he operated on chickens and guinea pigs but he used the grease not the blood of these animals become thus execrated and venomous tabernacles formerly he also used a recipe discovered by the satanic society of the rethéurgie stuptimat of which i have spoken before and he prepared a hash composed of flour meat eucharist bread mercury animal semen human blood acetate of morphine and aspic oil latterly and according to gévinger this abomination is more perilous yet he stuffs fishes with communion bread and with toxins skilfully graduated these toxins are chosen from those which produce madness or lockjaw when absorbed through the pores then when these fishes are thoroughly permeated with the substances sealed by sacrilege docre takes them out of the water lets them rot distills them and expresses from them an essential oil one drop of which will produce madness this drop it appears is applied externally by touching the hair as in balzac's thirteen Hmm, said durtal i am afraid that a drop of this oil long ago fell on the scalp of poor old gévinger what is interesting about this story is not the outlandishness of these diabolical pharmacopoeia so much as the psychology of the persons who invent and manipulate them think this is happening at the present day and it is the priests who have invented filters unknown to the sorcerers of the middle ages the priests no a priest and what a priest remarked carre gévinger is very precise he affirms that others use them bewitchment by veniniferous blood of mice took place in eighteen seventy nine at chalon sur marne in a demoniac circle to which the canon belonged it is true in eighteen eighty three in savoy the oil of which i have spoken was prepared in a group of defrocked abbés as you see docre is not the only one who practices this abominable science it is known in the convents some laymen even have an inkling of it but now admitting that these preparations are real and that they are active you have not explained how one can poison a man with them either from a distance or near at hand yes that's another matter one has a choice of two methods to reach the enemy one is aiming at the first and least used is this the magician employs a voyant a woman who is known in that world as a flying spirit she is a somnambulist who put into a hypnotic state can betake herself in spirit wherever one wishes her to go it is then possible to have her transmit the magic poisons to a person whom one designates hundreds of leagues away those who are stricken in this manner have seen no one and they go mad or die without suspecting the venefice but these voyants are not only rare they are also unreliable because other persons can likewise fix them in a cataleptic state and extract confessions from them so you see why persons like docre have recourse to the second method which is surer it consists in evoking just as in spiritism the soul of a dead person and sending it to strike the victim with the prepared spell the result is the same but the vehicle is different there concluded des hermies reported with painstaking exactness are the confidences which our friend gévinger made me this morning and dr joannes cures people poisoned in this manner asked Carré yes dr joannes to my knowledge has made inexplicable cures but with what gévinger tells me in this connection that the doctor celebrates a sacrifice to the glory of melchizedek i haven't the faintest idea what this sacrifice is but gévinger will perhaps enlighten us if he returns cured in spite of all i should not be displeased once in my life to get a good look at canon d'ocre said durtal not i he is the incarnation of the accursed on earth cried carré assisting his friends to put on their overcoats he lighted his lantern and while they were descending the stair as durtal complained of the cold des hermies burst into a laugh if your family had known the magical secrets of the plants you would not shiver this way he said it was learned in the sixteenth century that a child might be immune to heat or cold all his life if his hands were rubbed with the juice of absinthe before the twelfth month of his life had passed that you see is a tempting prescription less dangerous than those which canon d'ocre abuses 
once below after carhaix had closed the door of his tower they hastened their steps for the north wind swept the square after all said des hermies satanism aside and yet satanism also is a phase of religion admit that for two miscreants of our sort we hold singularly pious conversations i hope they will be counted in our favour up above no merit on our part replied durtal for what else is there to talk about conversations which do not treat of religion or art are so base and vain End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of La Barre by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Keen Wallace. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The memory of these frightful magisteria kept racing through his head next day, and while smoking cigarettes beside the fire, Durtal thought of Docre and Joannes fighting across Gévinger's back, smiting and parrying with incantations and exorcisms in the christian symbolism he said to himself the fish is one of the representations of christ doubtless the canon thinks to aggravate his sacrileges by feeding fishes on genuine hosts his is the reverse of the system of the medieval witches who chose a vile beast dedicated to the devil to submit the body of the saviour to the processes of digestion how real is the pretended power which the deicide chemists are alleged to wield what faith can we put in the tales of evoked larvae killing a designated person to order with corrosive oil and blood virus none unless one is extremely credulous and even a bit mad and yet come to think of it we find today unexplained and surviving under other names the mysteries which were so long reckoned the product of medieval imagination and superstition at the charity hospital dr louis transfers maladies from one hypnotized person to another wherein is that less miraculous than evocation of demons than spells cast by magicians or pastors a larva a flying spirit is not indeed more extraordinary than a microbe coming from afar and poisoning one without one's knowledge and the atmosphere can certainly convey spirits as well as bacilli certainly the ether carries untransformed emanations effluences electricity for instance or the fluids of a magnet which sends to a distant subject in order to traverse all paris to rejoin it science has no call to contest these phenomena on the other hand dr brown Secaur rejuvenates infirm old men and revitalizes the impotent with distillations from the parts of rabbits and cavies were not the elixirs of life and the love filters which the witches sold to the senile and impotent composed of similar or analogous substances human semen entered almost always in the middle ages into the compounding of these mixtures now hasn't dr brown Secau, after repeated experiments recently demonstrated the virtues of semen taken from one man and instilled into another finally the apparitions doppelgänger bilocations to speak thus of the spirits that terrified antiquity have not ceased to manifest themselves it would be difficult to prove that the experiments carried on for three years by dr crookes in the presence of witnesses were cheats if he has been able to photograph visible and tangible spectres we must recognize the veracity of the medieval thaumaturges incredible of course and wasn't hypnotism possession of one soul by another which could dedicate it to crime incredible only ten years ago we are groping in shadow that is sure but the hermy hit the bull's-eye when he remarked it is less important to know whether the modern pharmaceutic sacrileges are potent than to study the motives of the satanists and fallen priests who prepare them ah if there were some way of getting acquainted with canon docre of insinuating oneself into his confidence perhaps one would attain clear insight into these questions i learned long ago that there are no people interesting to know except saints scoundrels and cranks they are the only persons whose conversation amounts to anything persons of good sense are necessarily dull because they revolve over and over again the tedious topics of everyday life they are the crowd more or less intelligent but they are the crowd and they give me a pain yes but who will put me in touch with this monstrous priest and as he poked the fire durtal said to himself chant louve if he would but he won't there remains his wife who used to be well acquainted with Dogre. I must interrogate her and find out whether she still corresponds with him and sees him the entrance of madame chanteloube into his reflections saddened him he took out his watch and murmured what a bore she will come again and again i shall have to 
if only there were any possibility of convincing her of the futility of the carnal somersaults in any case she can't be very well pleased because to her frantic letter soliciting a meeting i responded three days later by a brief dry note inviting her to come here this evening it certainly was lacking in lyricism too much so perhaps he rose and went into his bedroom to make sure that the fire was burning brightly then he returned and sat down without even arranging his room as he had the other times now that he no longer cared for this woman gallantry and self-consciousness had fled he awaited her without impatience his slippers on his feet to tell the truth i have had nothing pleasant from hyacinthe except that kiss we exchanged when her husband was only a few feet away i certainly shall not again find her lips aflame and fragrant here her kiss is insipid madame chantelouve rang earlier than usual well she said sitting down you wrote me a nice letter how's that confess frankly that you are through with me he denied this but she shook her head well he said what have you to reproach me with having written you only a short note but there was someone here i was busy and i didn't have time to assemble pretty speeches not having set a date sooner i told you our relation necessitates precautions and we can't see each other very often i think i gave you clearly to understand my motives i am so stupid that i probably did not understand them you spoke to me of family reasons i believe yes rather vague well i couldn't go into detail and tell you that he stopped asking himself whether the time had come to break decisively with her but he remembered that he wanted her aid in getting information about docre that what tell me he shook his head hesitating not to tell her a lie but to insult and humiliate her well he went on since you force me to do it i will confess at whatever cost that i have had a mistress for several years i add that our relations are now purely amical very well she interrupted your family reasons are sufficient and then he pursued in a lower tone if you wish to know all well i have a child by her a child oh you poor dear she rose then there is nothing for me to do but withdraw but he seized her hands and at the same time satisfied with the success of his deception and ashamed of his brutality he begged her to stay a while she refused then he drew her to him kissed her hair and cajoled her her troubled eyes looked deep into his ah oh, then she said no let me undress not for the world yes oh the scene of the other night beginning all over again he murmured sinking overwhelmed into a chair he felt borne down burdened by an unspeakable weariness he undressed beside the fire and warmed himself while waiting for her to get to bed when they were in bed she enveloped him with her supple cold limbs now is it true that i am to come here no more he did not answer but understood that she had no intention of going away and that he had to do with a person of the staying kind tell me he buried his head in her breast to keep from having to answer tell me in my lips he beset her furiously to make her keep silent then he lay disabused weary happy that it was over when they lay down again she put her arm about his neck and ran her tongue around in his mouth like an auger but he paid little heed to caresses and remained feeble and pathetic then she bent over reached him and he groaned ah she exclaimed suddenly rising at last i have heard you cry he lay broken in body and spirit incapable of thinking two thoughts in sequence his brain seemed to whir undone in his skull he collected himself however rose and went into the other room to dress and let her do the same through the drawn portiere separating the two rooms he saw a little pinhole of light which came from the wax candle placed on the mantel opposite the curtain hyacinthe going back and forth would momentarily intercept this light then it would flash out again ah she said my poor darling you have a child the shot struck home said he to himself and aloud yes a little girl how old she will soon be six and he described her as flaxen-haired lively but in very frail health requiring multiple precautions and constant care you must have very sad evenings said madame chantelouve in a voice of emotion from behind the curtain oh yes 
if i were to die to-morrow what would become of those two unfortunates his imagination took wing he began himself to believe the mother and her his voice trembled tears very nearly came to his eyes he is unhappy my darling is she said raising the curtain and returning clothed into the room and that is why he looks so sad even when he smiles he looked at her surely at that moment her affection was not feigned she really clung to him why oh why had she had to have those rages of lust if it had not been for those they could probably have been good comrades sin moderately together and love each other better than if they wallowed in the sty of the senses but no such a relation was impossible with her he concluded seeing those sulphurous eyes that ravenous despoiling mouth she had sat down in front of his writing-table and was playing with a penholder were you working when i came in where are you in your history of gilles de ray i am getting along but i am hampered to make a good study of the satanism of the middle ages one ought to get really into the environment or at least fabricate a similar environment by becoming acquainted with the practitioners of satanism all about us for the psychology is the same though the operations differ and looking her straight in the eye thinking the story of the child had softened her he hazarded all on a cast ah if your husband would give me the information he has about canon d'ocre she stood motionless but her eyes clouded over she did not answer true he said chanteloube suspecting our liaison she interrupted him my husband has no concern with the relations which may exist between you and me he evidently suffers when i go out as to-night for he knows where i am going but i admit no right of control either on his part or mine he is free and i am free to go wherever we please i must keep house for him watch out for his interests take care of him love him like a devoted companion and that i do with all my heart as to being responsible for my acts they're none of his business no more his than anybody else's she spoke in a crisp incisive tone the devil said durtal you certainly reduce the importance of the role of husband i know that my ideas are not the ideas of the world i live in and they appear not to be yours in my first marriage they were a source of trouble and disaster but i have an iron will and i bend the people who love me in addition i despise deceit so when a few years after marriage i became smitten on a man i quite frankly told my husband and confessed my fault dare i ask you in what spirit he received this confidence he was so grieved that in one night his hair turned white he could not bear what he called wrongly i think my treason and he killed himself ah said durtal dumbfounded by the placid and resolute air of this woman but suppose he had strangled you first she shrugged her shoulders and picked a cat hair off her skirt the result he resumed after a silence being that you are now almost free that your second husband tolerates let us not discuss my second husband he is an excellent man who deserves a better wife i have absolutely no reason to speak of chanteloube otherwise than with praise and then oh let's talk of something else for i have had sufficient botheration on this subject from my confessor who interdicts me from the holy table he contemplated her and saw yet another hyacinthe a hard pertinacious woman whom he had not known not a sign nor an accent of emotion nothing while she was describing the suicide of her first husband she did not even seem to imagine that she had a crime on her conscience she remained pitiless and yet a moment ago when she was commiserating him because of his fictitious parenthood he had thought she was trembling after all perhaps she is acting a part like myself he remained awed by the turn the conversation had taken he sought mentally a way of getting back to the subject from which hyacinthe had diverted him of the satanism of canon d'ocre well let us think of that no more she said coming very near she smiled and was once more the hyacinthe he knew but if on my account you can no longer take communion she interrupted him would you be sorry if i did not love you and she kissed his eyes he squeezed her politely in his arms but he felt her trembling and from motives of prudence he got away is he so inexorable your confessor he is an incorruptible man of the old school i chose him expressly 
if i were a woman it seems to me i should take on the contrary a confessor who was pliable and caressable and who would not violently pillory my dainty little sins i would have him indulgent oiling the hinges of confession enticing forth with beguiling gestures the misdeeds that hung back it is true there would be risk of seducing a confessor who would perhaps be defenceless and that would be incest because the priest is a spiritual father and it would also be sacrilege because the priest is consecrated oh speaking to herself i was mad mad suddenly carried away he observed her sparks glinted in the myopic eyes of this extraordinary woman evidently he had just stumbled unwittingly onto a guilty secret of hers well and he smiled do you still commit infidelities to me with a false me i do not understand do you receive at night the visit of the incubus which resembles me no since i have been able to possess you in the flesh i have no need to evoke your image what a downright satanist you are maybe i have been so constantly associated with priests you're a great one he said bowing now listen to me and do me a great favour you know canon d'ocre i should say well what in the world is this man about whom i hear so much from whom gévinger and des hermies ah you consult the astrologer yes he met the canon in my own house but i didn't know that d'ocre was acquainted with des hermies who didn't attend our receptions in those days des hermies has never seen d'ocre he knows him as i do only by hearsay from gévinger now briefly how much truth is there in the stories of the sacrileges of which this priest is accused i don't know docre is a gentleman learned and well-bred he was even the confessor of royalty and he would certainly have become a bishop if he had not quitted the priesthood i have heard a great deal of evil spoken about him but especially in the clerical world people are so fond of saying all sorts of things but you knew him personally yes i even had him for a confessor then it isn't possible that you don't know what to make of him very possible indeed presumable look here you have been beating around the bush a long time exactly what do you want to know everything you care to tell me is he young or old handsome or ugly rich or poor he is forty years old very fastidious of his person and he spends a lot of money do you believe that he indulges in sorcery that he celebrates the black mass it is quite possible pardon me for dunning you for extorting information from you as if with forceps suppose i were to ask you a really personal question this faculty of incubacy why certainly i got it from him i hope you are satisfied yes and no thanks for your kindness in telling me i know i am abusing your good nature but one more question do you know of any way whereby i may see canon d'ocre in person he is at nîmes pardon me for the moment he is in paris ah you know that well if i knew of a way i would not tell you be sure it would not be good for you to get to seeing too much of this priest you admit then that he is dangerous i do not admit nor deny i tell you simply that you have nothing to do with him yes i have i want to get material for my book from him get it from somebody else besides she said putting on her hat in front of the glass my husband got a bad scare and broke with that man and refuses to receive him that is no reason why what do you mean oh nothing he repressed the remark why you should not see him she did not insist she was poking her hair under her veil heavens what a fright i look he took her hands and kissed them when shall i see you again i thought i wasn't to come here any more oh now you know i love you as a good friend tell me when will you come again tomorrow night unless it is inconvenient for you not at all then au revoir their lips met and above all don't think about canon d'ocre she said turning and shaking her finger at him threateningly as she went out devil take you and your reticence he said to himself closing the door after her End of chapter 15
chapter sixteen of la barre by jory karl heismans translated by keen wallace this librivox recording is in the public domain when i think said durtal to himself the next morning that in bed at the moment when the most pertinacious will succumbs i held firm and refused to yield to the instances of hyacinthe wishing to establish a footing here and that after the carnal decline at that instant when annihilated man recovers alas his reason i supplicated her myself to continue her visits why i simply cannot understand myself deep down i have not got over my firm resolution of breaking with her but i could not dismiss her like a cocotte and to justify his inconsistency i hoped to get some information about the canon oh on that subject i am not through with her she's got to make up her mind to speak out and quit answering me by monosyllables and guarded phrases as she did yesterday indeed what can she have been up to with that abbe who was her confessor and who by her own admission launched her into incubacy she has been his mistress that is certain and how many other of these priests she has gone round with have been her lovers also for she confessed in a cry that those are the men she loves ah if one went about much in the clerical world one would doubtless learn remarkable things concerning her and her husband it is strange all the same that chanteloube who plays a singular role in that household has acquired a deplorable reputation and she hasn't never have i heard anybody speak of her dodges but oh what a fool i am it isn't strange her husband doesn't confine himself to religious and polite circles he hobnobs with men of letters and in consequence exposes himself to every sort of slander while she if she takes a lover chooses him out of a pious society in which not one of us would ever be received and then abbes are discreet but how explain her infatuation with me by the simple fact that she is surfeited of priests and a layman serves as a change of diet just the same she is quite singular and the more i see her the less i understand her there are in her three distinct beings first the woman seated or standing up whom i knew in her drawing-room reserved almost haughty who becomes a good companion in private affectionate and even tender then the woman in bed completely changed in voice and bearing a harlot spitting mud losing all shame third and last the pitiless vixen the thorough satanist whom i perceived yesterday what is the binding alloy that amalgamates all these beings of hers i can't say hypocrisy no doubt no i don't think so for she is often of a disconcerting frankness in moments it is true of forgetfulness and unguardedness seriously what is the use of trying to understand the character of this pious harlot and to be candid with myself what i wish ideally will never be realized she does not ask me to take her to swell places does not force me to dine with her exacts no revenue she isn't trying to compromise and blackmail me i shan't find a better but oh lord i now prefer to find no one at all it suits me perfectly to entrust my carnal business to mercenary agents for my twenty francs i shall receive more considerate treatment there is no getting around it only professionals know how to cook up a delicious sensual dish odd he said to himself after a reflective silence but all proportions duly observed gilles de Ray divides himself like her into three different persons first the brave and honest fighting man then the refined and artistic criminal finally the repentant sinner the mystic he is a mass of contradictions and excesses viewing his life as a whole one finds each of his vices compensated by a contradictory virtue but there is no key characteristic which reconciles them he is of an overweening arrogance but when contrition takes possession of him he falls on his knees in front of the people of low estate and has the tears the humility of a saint his ferocity passes the limits of the human scale and yet he is generous and sincerely devoted to his friends whom he cares for like a brother when the demon has mauled them impetuous in his desires and nevertheless patient brave in battle a coward confronting eternity he is despotic and violent yet he is putty in the hands of his flatterers he is now in the clouds now in the abyss never on the trodden plain the lowlands of the soul 
his confessions do not throw any light on his invariable tendency to extremes when asked who suggested to him the idea of such crimes he answers no one the thought came to me only from myself from my reveries my daily pleasures my taste for debauchery and he arraigns his indolence and constantly asserts that delicate repasts and strong drink have helped uncage the wild animal in him unresponsive to mediocre passions he is carried away alternately by good as well as evil and he bounds from spiritual pole to spiritual pole he dies at the age of thirty-six but he has completely exhausted the possibilities of joy and grief he has adored death loved as a vampire kissed inimitable expressions of suffering and terror and has himself been racked by implacable remorse insatiable fear he has nothing more to try nothing more to learn here below let's see said durtal running over his notes i left him at the moment when the expiation begins as i had written in one of my preceding chapters the inhabitants of the region dominated by the chateau of the marshal know now who the inconceivable monster is who carries children off and cuts their throats but no one dare speak when at a turn in the road the tall figure of the butcher is seen approaching all flee huddle behind the hedges or shut themselves up in the cottages and gilles passes haughty and sombre in the solitude of villages where no one dares venture abroad impunity seems assured him for what peasant would be mad enough to attack a master who could have him gibbeted at a word again if the humble give up the idea of bringing gilles de ray to justice his peers have no intention of combating him for the benefit of peasants whom they disdain and his liege the duke of brittany jean V, burdens him with favours and blandishments in order to extort his lands from him at a low price a single power can rise and above feudal complicities above earthly interest avenge the oppressed and the weak the church and it is the church in fact in the person of jean de malestroit which rises up before the monster and fells him jean de malestroit bishop of nantes belongs to an illustrious line he is a near kinsman of jean V, and his incomparable piety his infallible christian wisdom and his enthusiastic charity make him venerated even by the duke the wailing of gilles decimated flock reaches his ears in silence he begins an investigation and setting spies upon the marshal waits only for an opportune moment to begin the combat and gilles suddenly commits an inexplicable crime which permits the bishop to march forthwith upon him and smite him to recuperate his shattered fortune gilles has sold his seigneury of saint etienne de mer morte to a subject of jean V, guillaume le ferron who delegates his brother jean le ferron to take possession of the domain some days later the marshal gathers the two hundred men of his military household and at their head marches on saint etienne there the day of pentecost when the assembled people are hearing mass he precipitates himself sword in hand into the church sweeps aside the faithful throwing them into tumult and before the dumbfounded priest threatens to cleave jean le ferron who is praying the ceremony is broken off the congregation take flight gilles drags le ferron pleading for mercy to the chateau orders that the drawbridge be let down and by force occupies the place while his prisoner is carried away to tiffauges and thrown into an underground dungeon gilles has at one and the same time violated the unwritten law of brittany forbidding any baron to raise troops without the consent of the duke and committed double sacrilege in profaning a chapel and seizing jean le ferron who is a tonsured clerk of the church the bishop learns of this outrage and prevails upon the reluctant jean V to march against the rebel then while one army advances on saint etienne which gilles abandons to take refuge with his little band in the fortified manor of Machecoul, another army lays siege to tiffauge during this time the priest hastens his redoubled investigations he delegates commissioners and procurators in all the villages where children have disappeared he himself quits his palace at nantes travels about the countryside and takes the depositions of the bereft the people at last speak and on their knees beseech the bishop to protect them enraged by the atrocities which they reveal he swears that justice shall be done it takes a month to hear all the reports by letters patent jean de malestroit establishes publicly the infamatio of gilles then when all the forms of canonic procedure have been gone through with he launches the mandate of arrest 
in this writ of warrant given at nantes the thirteenth day of september in the year of our lord fourteen forty the bishop notes all the crimes imputed to the marshal then in an energetic style he commands his diocese to march against the assassin and dislodge him thus we do enjoin you each and all individually by these presents that ye cite immediately and peremptorily without counting any man upon his neighbour without discharging the burden any man upon his neighbour that ye cite before us or before the official of our cathedral church for monday of the feast of exaltation of the holy cross the nineteenth of september gilles noble baron de ray subject to our puissance and to our jurisdiction and we do ourselves cite him by these presents to appear before our bar to answer for the crimes which weigh upon him execute these orders and do each of you cause them to be executed and the next day the captain at arms jean l'abbé acting in the name of the duke and robin guillaume notary acting in the name of the bishop present themselves escorted by a small troop before the chateau of marchecoul what sudden change of heart does the marshal now experience too feeble to hold his own in the open field he can nevertheless defend himself behind the sheltering ramparts yet he surrenders roger de briqueville and gilles sillet his trusted counsellors have taken flight he remains alone with prelati who also attempts in vain to escape he like gilles is loaded with chains robin guillaume searches the fortress from top to bottom he discovers bloody clothes imperfectly calcinated ashes which prelati has not had time to throw into the latrines amid universal maledictions and cries of horror gilles and his servitors are conducted to nîmes and incarcerated in the chateau de la tour neuve now this part is not very clear said durtal to himself remembering what a daredevil the marshal had been how can we reconcile ourselves to the idea that he could give himself up to certain death and torture without striking a blow was he softened weakened by his nights of debauchery terrified by the audacity of his own sacrileges ravaged and torn by remorse was he tired of living as he did and did he give himself up as so many murderers do because he was irresistibly attracted to punishment nobody knows did he think himself above the law because of his lofty rank or did he hope to disarm the duke by playing upon his venality offering him a ransom of manors and farmland one answer is as plausible as another he may also have known how hesitant jean v had been for fear of rousing the wrath of the nobility of his duchy about yielding to the objurgations of the bishop and raising troops for the pursuit and arrest well there is no document which answers these questions an author can take some liberties here and set down his own conjectures but that curious trial is going to give me some trouble as soon as gilles and his accomplices are incarcerated two tribunals are organized one ecclesiastical to judge the crimes coming under the jurisdiction of the church the other civil to judge those on which the state must pass to tell the truth the civil tribunal which is present at the ecclesiastical hearings effaces itself completely as a matter of form it makes a brief cross-examination but it pronounces the sentence of death which the church cannot permit itself to utter according to the old adage ecclesia abhorret a sanguine the ecclesiastical trial lasts five weeks the civil forty-eight hours it seems that to hide behind the robes of the bishop the duke of brittany has voluntarily subordinated the role of civil justice which ordinarily stands up for its rights against the encroachments of the ecclesiastical court jean de malestroit presides over the hearings he chooses for assistance the bishops of mans of saint brieuc and of saint lo then in addition he surrounds himself with a troop of jurists who work in relays in the interminable sessions of the trial some of the more important are guillaume de montigny advocate of the secular court jean blanchet bachelor of laws guillaume Groiguet and robert de la riviere licentiates in outroque jure and hervé lévy seneschal of quimper pierre de l'hôpital chancellor of brittany who is to preside over the civil hearings after the canonic judgment assists jean de malestroit the public prosecutor is guillaume chaperon curate of saint nicolas an eloquent and subtle man adjunct to him to relieve him of the fatigue of the readings are geoffroy pibrere dean of saint marie and jacques de panquedic official of the church of nantes 
in connection with the episcopal jurisdiction the church has called in the assistance of the extraordinary tribunal of the inquisition for the repression of the crime of heresy then comprehending perjury blasphemy sacrilege all the crimes of magic it sits at the side of jean de malestroit in the redoubtable and learned person of jean blouin of the order of saint dominique delegated by the grand inquisitor of france guillaume merici to the functions of vice inquisitor of the city and diocese of nantes the tribunal constituted the trial opens the first thing in the morning because judges and witnesses in accordance with the custom of the times must proceed fasting to the giving and hearing of evidence the testimony of the parents of the victims is heard and robin guillaume acting sergeant at arms the man who arrested the marshal at Marchecoul, reads the citation bidding gilles de ray appear he is brought in and declares disdainfully that he does not recognize the competence of the tribunal but as canonic procedure demands the prosecutor at once in order that by this means the correction of sorcery be not prevented petitions for and obtains from the tribunal a ruling that this objection be quashed as being null in law and frivolous he begins to read to the accused the counts on which he is to be tried gilles cries out that the prosecutor is a liar and a traitor then guillaume chaperon extends his hand toward the crucifix swears that he is telling the truth and challenges the marshal to take the same oath but this man who has recoiled from no sacrilege is troubled he refuses to perjure himself before god and the session ends with gilles still vociferating outrageous denunciations of the prosecutor the preliminaries completed a few days later the public hearings begin the act of indictment is read aloud to the accused in front of an audience who shudder when chaperon indefatigably enumerates the crimes one by one and formally accuses the marshal of having practised sorcery and magic of having polluted and slain little children of having violated the immunities of holy church at saint etienne de mer morte then after a silence he resumes his discourse and making no account of the murders but dwelling only on the crimes of which the punishment foreseen by canonic law can be fixed by the church he demands that gilles be smitten with double excommunication first as an evoker of demons a heretic apostate and renegade second as a sodomist and perpetrator of sacrilege gilles who has listened to this incisive and scathing indictment completely loses control of himself he insults the judges calls them simonists and ribalds and refuses to answer the questions put to him the prosecutor and advocates are unmoved they invite him to present his defence again he denounces them insults them but when called upon to refute them he remains silent the bishop and vice inquisitor declare him in contempt and pronounce against him the sentence of excommunication which is soon made public they decide in addition that the hearing shall be continued next day a ring of the doorbell interrupted durtal's perusal of his notes des hermies entered i have just seen carré he is ill he said that's so what seems to be the matter nothing very serious a slight attack of bronchitis he'll be up in a few days if he will consent to keep quiet i must go see him tomorrow said durtal and what are you doing inquired des hermies working hard why yes i am digging into the trial of the noble baron de ray it will be as tedious to read as to write and you don't know yet when you will finish your volume no answered durtal stretching as a matter of fact i wish it might never be finished what will become of me when it is i'll have to look around for another subject and when i find one do all the drudgery of planning and then getting the introductory chapter written the mean part of any literary work is getting started i shall pass mortal hours doing nothing really when i think it over literature has only one excuse for existing it saves the person who makes it from the disgustingness of life and charitably it lessens the distress of us few who still love art few indeed and the number keeps diminishing the new generation no longer interests itself in anything except gambling and jockeys yes you're quite right the men can't spare from gambling the time to read so it is only the society women who buy books and pass judgment on them it is to the lady as schopenhauer called her to the little goose as i should characterize her that we are indebted for these shoals of lukewarm and mucilaginous novels which nowadays get puffed you think then that we are in for a pretty literature 
naturally you can't please women by enunciating vigorous ideas in a crisp style but durtal went on after a silence it is perhaps best that the case should be as it is the rare artists who remain have no business to be thinking about the public the artist lives and works far from the drawing-room far from the clamour of the little fellows who fix up the custom-made literature the only legitimate source of vexation to an author is to see his work when printed exposed to the contaminating curiosity of the crowd that is said des hermies a veritable prostitution to advertise a thing for sale is to accept the degrading familiarities of the first comer but our impenitent pride and also our need of the miserable sous make it impossible for us to keep our manuscripts sheltered from the asses art ought to be like one's beloved out of reach out of the world art and prayer are the only decent ejaculations of the soul so when one of my books appears i let go of it with horror i get as far as possible from the environment in which it may be supposed to circulate i care very little about a book of mine until years afterward when it has disappeared from all the shop windows and is out of print briefly i am in no hurry to finish the history of gilles de ray which unfortunately is getting finished in spite of me i don't give a damn how it is received are you doing anything this evening no why shall we dine together certainly and while durtal was putting on his shoes des hermies remarked to me the striking thing about the so-called literary world of this epoch is its cheap hypocrisy what a lot of laziness for instance that word dilettante has served to cover yes it's a great old alibi but it is confounding to see that the critic who to-day decrees himself the title of dilettante accepts it as a term of praise and does not even suspect that he is slapping himself the whole thing can be resolved into syllogism the dilettante has no personal temperament since he objects to nothing and likes everything whoever has no personal temperament has no talent then rejoined des hermies putting on his hat an author who boasts of being a dilettante confesses by that very thing that he is no author exactly end of chapter sixteen